Well, the thing, the thing is that when I was very young, I think that without my knowing it, I was involved in searching for God much more than now when I'm old enough to tell you that's the truth. When I was really little, um, there used to be this uh, classic comics where they did famous novels and check a comic book and they had one on the Bible. It was a real thick one. And I loved that book. I used to read it. And it always had God speaking to the prophets. And there was this little balloon that comes down from heaven, you know, with this statement. And then at a certain point in the, in the progression of the Bible, they said that this was the last prophet that God never spoke to. And after that, God never spoke anymore. And I was like really little. I said, no, that's not right. I knew it was that just absolutely knew that was right. And then the other thing I remember I got also at one point very, very, my family is Jewish, but not religious Jewish, but all of a sudden I got consumed by this desire to go to temple and do all this stuff in the Sunday school and get barbers fit and whatnot. And uh, I had made my mother buy, we had to buy tickets to go to the high holy days to go to the temple. It was very expensive and I made her buy all these tickets. And I was probably like 11 or 12 at the time. Because Thomas was 13, I think, and I haven't yet. And I went through all this training and blah, 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 blah. And one day the rabbi was saying, well, you know, we, we in reform Judaism, we don't believe that in the Messiah. We believe there will be a messianic age, a time when all mankind will live in harmony and love and brotherhood and, you know, till the earth and all that stuff. And, but no actual Messiah. And I looked at him and I said, no, that's not right because Jesus came. You know, where did I get that from? I didn't say it, I didn't say it, but, but I saw it, and I knew that right after that I left, that I never went back again. It was really strange. And then I got this real kind of devotion to Jesus out of where I don't know. And I used to cry about Jesus. So you could kind of say, you know, in a way that something was leading me towards Baba. And I remember um, when, when I was also very small, my mother took me into Manhattan. And it was a Sunday, we lived in Brooklyn, and we took the subway, we got out of the subway, and when we came out from underground, there was this big building, it was very dark and mysterious, and somehow drew me to it. I was really interested, and I said, Mom, what is that building? And she said, that's the Metropolitan Opera House. And of course, that is the place where Margaret Krask eventually wound up teaching in the Valley School, and where I eventually wound up studying with her. So even then, there were little you know, things, but uh, where it came from, I can't say, you know. And I did, I like to read, read about it, about mysticism and things like that at a certain point. In any case, I, much to the chagrin of my parents, I was studying uh, art and I had a scholarship at Syracuse University that I'd won the first prize in the national competition for painting, you know, a big deal, and go to school for tuition, and all of a sudden announced I was going to not go anywhere, I was going to study dancing. I got <laughs> consumed by this desire to study dance. And uh, I wound up through a chain of circumstances at the Metropolitan Opera House Ballet School. And there I enrolled. And after uh, about a year, I suppose, I got into Marlon class because she didn't teach for beginners. And uh, knew her for a good two years or so. Uh, before I heard about, I mean, we heard about Baba. I mean, his name wasn't mentioned, but I remember when when Miss Crass suddenly had to leave and go away for some long period of time because the man that she lived in, with in India had had an accident and she had to go to take care of him. She, that's the kind of thing. So she had a substitute teacher, but I didn't really think about it. You know, people kind of joked about her being a yogi. There was this, this story that they told her when she was working with a ballet company. I think I've told this before. The invalid is a costume called tutu, which is made out of tarp and kind of stiff gauze. And when she was working with this company, American Ballet Theater, prior to this time when she was teaching at the Met, one of those tutus disappeared. And they spread the story around that she'd eaten it because they heard that yogis in India swallow lots and lots of grass. I mean, nobody knew anything. You know, honestly, it was such a time. It's not like now. No one knew anything knew about it. It was also an esoteric. And even the first time I went to see which I'll tell you. But in any case, there I was at the Met, and I was studying. I got in her class, and I was working with her, and getting into all kinds of trouble all the time, because I was very temperamental and a very bad student. And uh, eventually, in 1954, I wound up in, in Williamsburg, Virginia, in a show called Common Glory. It was a historical pageant. And at that show, was one of the, one of the 
women, Maria Dale, and I was a dancer. She had worked with him before and got me the job. So she was there. She was a pupil of Miss Crass. And another fellow named Peter Saul came there. He did not know Miss Crass, but he and Marie got together a lot privately and talked about things and sat out in the moonlight and played the recorder and read poetry and drove me absolutely nuts. And I, what's going on here? He said, she was telling me about Bob, but I didn't know because she heard about it from Tex just the year before. So we are all there in, in uh, Williamsburg, and Peter and I were kind of rivals, friendly rivals. And he, you know, he was like he was the understudy for the lead, and I thought I was the understudy. We <laughs> fought and we were friends. And eventually, we, the summer came to an end. We all went back to New York, and Peter decided to come back and study with Miss Press as well. So one night, Peter and I went out for coffee after class. And in the sitting and having coffee, we got into another one of our arguments. And finally, Peter, in a huge exasperation, turned and looked at me and said, Well, you are so horrible and so awful. The only thing that could help you would be to make a bottle. <laughs> and I said, well, who's that? And I see, I've been around in this class for those years already. And I said, so who does he start to tell me about reincarnation? Which he just heard about two weeks before, so he knew all about it. <laughs> but you know, the minute I heard that, I told me it wasn't even, I didn't accept it, it just was there, it was right. And I, I accepted Baba. I didn't know really what I was accepting, I guess, but I did, absolutely. So I made an appointment to go to see Miss Crass, and, and she would see people in a hotel room. And one of the dancers who was kind of naughty said to me, Well, you know, when you better be prepared when you go there, you see, uh, she has all this incense and blue lights in her apartment. <laughs> And strange, weird happenings, you know. <laughs> and I went up there by the mirror and were napping. Um, but the funny thing is, when she said to me, when I went to ask her if I could speak to her, and she said yes, I said, I would like to, could I know about Meher Baba? And she said yes. And I said, well, Miss Chris, I don't know if I'm good enough for Meher Baba. And she looked at me, you know, the way she, those of you who know her or knew her, she said, well, my dear, Baba's even for criminals. <laughs> And I started. So, you know, um, Peter and Marie and myself and Viola Barbara and another woman, Susan Rossin, lived all in the same building. And behind us in the building lived Tex. And so we were kind of like an astronaut to ourselves. And we would go to see Miss Crask and get stories about Baba and come back and then we'd share them with each other. And she had a little shoebox with some photos. And in those days, you didn't get photos so easily as you get now. The whole time she, and she'd give us her photos. And basically what she did was to, to tell us stories about Baba and to, to bring Baba to life for us. And very little of the theoretical side. Uh, I, the first book I wrote was the, it's the Perfect Master, the original, yeah, the Perfect Master, the original Perfect book. And then we did get discourses, but it was not emphasized particularly to us. What was emphasized was the love Baba as, as uh, as Baba, I mean, I can't say Baba as a human. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's very hard to say that, but that's what something. So that when when Baba and, uh, was announced, that Baba was coming to the West in '56 in a funny kind of way, just like you all said. Who said they were prepared to to meet him in a way? Because we felt only we knew him in a sense. So um, we all. I was at that time, and I just got into a ballet company in Canada, so I was able to come down to New York for that first meeting for the weekend, and I was not able to go on that trip around the States with you all. And so I went, came down, and uh, we went out to the airport to see Baba come, Bob's plane arrive. And uh, we were all very nervous, and Miss Crass was particularly nervous. She was really, she had a brood around her, you know, her. her. And, and uh, this is, the, I have to tell the story, it's not admitted in any kind of nasty way. <laughs> But we were standing with Miss Craskin and uh, waiting, and uh, Ivy Deuce was there, and she saw us, and she came over, and she said, Oh, Margaret, what a lovely group you have. And Miss Craskin drew herself up, and she said, They're not my group. You know, she never went to so <laughs> they're, they're not my group. And, and I said, Oh, no, well, I mean, I just wanted to say how nice, and they looked about, and Miss Craskin, never mind. She said, It isn't that I don't love them, I just don't claim them. <laughs> The way she was with us. You know, we were never allowed. We were never allowed or encouraged or given the idea that anybody was between Baba and us. You see, and it was very difficult because I was in daily contact with her, more than daily contact, because we'd have maybe two classes a day, and then I 
to see her in the evening sometime or go out to lunch. I mean, I was full of, and all, and I just really thought, I don't really love Bob, I love her. Uh, she's the one I love. It's very, very difficult. She never ever, and she would stomp on I mean, you can see it even now with Monty Eric just very quick to put people up when they start telling him how wonderful he is or what a great thing he did. No, direct to Bob was her. It was the way we were to be. It was very hard to understand that and very hard to realize that. Anyway, we went to the airport, there we were, and Bob arrived, and we first saw him through a window in his pink coat. And he really, really did look radiant and, and beautiful. It's hard to say to people that Bob was beautiful because, you know, in a funny time, when he wasn't beautiful, you know, in the sense of Hollywood medicine, but he was extremely beautiful and extremely radiant and pink and scrubbed and it was just incredible but not miraculous in a sense because we kind of expected that and then Baba came out into this hall and there we were all were lined up and uh, he was coming down the hall and reading this one and now we taking somebody by the chin and uh, the one Miss Craster looked really adoring and, had, and Peter came by and he had some special you know maybe by the chin and took him by the shoulders and I said oh this is so wonderful now it's going to be my turn you know I'm going to be able to be recognized the great thing I am. And Bob walked down and he did it and then he walked right past me and didn't even look. <laughs> so that was my first contact with Bob. That kind of thing. Then we went into New York and we went to the hotel. Eventually we were called in to see Baba. And Baba called all the dancers and Miss Kraskin. There were different groups of people going in and doing but he called all, us, all of us in and Miss Kraskin standing there. And she introduced each of us to Baba in turn with our names. And when my turn came, I went over and sat down on Baba's side in that chaise lounge. And it, I, it, 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 Linker said it, so I'm only going to repeat it, that when he opened his arms and I embraced him, or he embraced me, it was like falling into this soft, this, this warm, this um, place that was home. That was where you really, I mean, I can't explain it because I didn't think that. And I didn't expect that, but it was just so right and so wonderful and so warm and so happy. And uh, there I was, and I'm now going to be here forever. And I said there's somebody to me to show you. Maybe with Bob, that's enough. <laughs> he gave me a, a piece of fruit facade, and, um, and that was my first meeting with Bob. And it was probably, it wasn't mine, you know, lights didn't go off. It wasn't something. I wanted that. Oh boy, I wanted to have an enormous reaction. Some people met Bob and he saw into tears and fell through themselves on the floor. And, and I really wanted that, but I didn't have that. I, was, I had probably what more substantial, you know, but I didn't know it. I was always with Bob wanting something more than what I was, what I thought I was getting. So it was a source of great, uh, often happiness. It wasn't always happy being around Bob for me. Uh, it was difficult. Uh, later years, I realized so many things. I mean, it's not really enough time to tell all that, but how much my mind got in between me and Baba, thinking, you know, why isn't he tapping me on the shoulder? Why is he doing it to text? Why is he doing it to Peter? Why does he, why does he, you know, not give me some, you know? In the meantime, people are taking all these movies, and now I see in the movies after all these years, yes, where we were carrying Baba in the chair, like he, like he put his hands on my shoulder and he do this to me and he'd take my arm and he'd do all this stuff. And the first time I saw one of those films, I nearly passed out. I did not believe it. <laughs> so, uh, in any case, I met, I was with Bob in 56 in the Del Monaco and I was with Bob in 58 down in Myrtle Beach for that wonderful time when the dancers carried Bob up in the chair many, 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 many times. And I was with Bob in 62 in India, the East West Gathering. <coughs> And each time was very, very difficult. And I could, you know, talk a lot about some difficulties. That's just some terrible personal but, um, <laughs> but, you know, I wanted to say I had a very hard time with Ms. Krask and a very hard time with Bob and besides with others who I with myself and all of those incidents. They have brought me closer to Bob and then Bob had still said, oh, I love you, you're the best thing in the world, and I just sit by my side and that's it. You see, it never happened like that. And, and so many of my out of class, and she was not nice. <laughs> she she'd throw me out. And we had some very bad food things in the show. And in any case, one night, many, many, many years later, after Bob had dropped his body, many, many years later, I was sitting at home late at night, 
and this television program came on. It was a Walt Disney one hour program, and they had taken all these old Donald Duck films and made a new film out of it. And I have to tell you that Robert's nickname for me was Donald Duck. And Monty said, You didn't have to sign to go like this. She goes, There were opportunities for me to do things like I, it's, that's another long story, but there would be communications where Bob would refer to me as Donald. And I was so, that's cute. You didn't have to be, you know, Donald Duck. He doesn't really know who I am, but Donald Duck, you know, that was one of my big things. I'm kind of jumping over things because I really always felt that Bob didn't really know who I was, and that I was kind of in this party on the bottom and behind it. But he did call me Donald Duck. Anyway, there's this. Comes on television, and there's Donald Duck. And the story was that Donald Duck was the star of the Walt Disney Film Studios. And his rival was Mickey Mouse, Clark Lyle. And he was always getting into trouble because he was so difficult to work with. And the directors of the films couldn't bear to work with Donald Duck, and they were leaving him out of films, and they didn't want him in their film. And it was impossible. And he got worse and worse and worse. And finally, he was fired from the Walt Disney because he was so temperamental and difficult. And then even Daisy Duck, his girlfriend, left him. And then all his friends left him. And he was all alone and he didn't know what to do. And he went to the psychiatrist and he went to the cures and he did all these things that he couldn't, you know, he was just totally at the bottom. And then one night he fell asleep and he had a dream. And in the dream, he saw himself as others saw him. See, and he woke up in the dream and he realized what was wrong, and it was all over. And he went back to the films to the Disney studio to try to that. And I'm sitting there thinking, You think that Baba doesn't know who you are or what you are? And you think that Donald Duck is cute, but no, he won't tell it was the perfect name for me because that's the way I was. Anyway, with you know, two minutes, um, when Baba, when Baba um, dropped his body. Then came a time for a lot of serious remorse and a lot of a lot of um, feelings that I hadn't done a very good job of it all and that I hadn't done what I should have done and could have done and didn't do a lot of things and didn't wasn't as good as I should have been and all that kind of stuff and I had missed my opportunity and Bob was gone and I really went into a real you know bad time and after about something like a year, and I have to tell you that I never went around talking about Baba. If only the, my friends, we would talk about Baba together, maybe, but I never went to any meetings of Baba meetings, or never talked about Baba. And suddenly, after some months of being in this very low state, I started going to Baba House in New York. And then I would meet somebody, and they'd maybe ask me something about it. How was it when you met Baba? And I'd start in a small way to talk about Baba. And that kind of brought Baba back to me so much. So people think, you know, oh, thank you for talking about Baba. It's so nice that you talk. But it means so much to me to be able to do it. It brings Baba so much to me. That led to every year as a dancer with the Metropolitan Opera where I was working, we would go on tour for six weeks to different cities and spend a week in each city. And suddenly I thought, well, this talking about Baba is not so bad. Maybe I should look up in each city some Baba people, you know, I mean, not to give a talk or anything like that, just to, oh, you know, the, so it's starting to open out. In the first place, it was in Boston, and I had Jan and Pascal Kaplan's phone number, and I spent all week long not calling them, thinking I should call and not calling them, and on Saturday, or Sunday even it was, I called finally, and they said, oh, it's too bad you didn't call earlier. Is, Pat, is Pascal here? Yeah, yeah. Who was it that you had that was in May? It might be Sir, somebody, one of the biggies, anyway, <laughs> was there. He said, and he's left and you missed him. <laughs> but come on over anyway. We would we, we, like to meet you. So I think I went over there and I met and, and it was Pascal and Jan, actually, who said to me, you know, if you're going to be next week, I told them next week I'd be in Atlanta with them, that that was the next stop for me. If you're going to be there, you have the opportunity, why don't you go down to the center for a day or two if you have any time? And, oh, you know, why? I don't want to go to the center. What's the point? Bob's not there. You know, there's no reason to go to the center. And they kind of insisted on it. And so I got to Atlanta and I thought, all right, I'll give them a break. And I called and made an arrangement. I had the weekend off. I went down to the center and uh, I arrived at the airport. Jane Haynes came to pick me up and I didn't have any contact with her. I didn't tell her I was coming. She did that all on her own. She came to pick me up 
and she took me to the center and she drove me to Baba's house and she opened and unlocked the thing and she let me go and go by myself. And it was such an amazing thing with a complete break for me to come back to the center to see. Of course, Bob was there. In fact, Bob was there more, maybe, in a funny kind of way. And that started this whole progression of, of, of being with people and seeing people opening out and not being shut up in my little, little cage like that. So, here I am. <laughs>